state senator are quite varied. I, um, number one, am there in Tallahassee to represent the interests of the people in my district, uh, whether they be uh, young people, middle-aged people, elderly people, whether they be business owners, whether they be employees, whether they be school students, school teachers, uh, just all the people in my district. Uh, I'm there to, to represent and try to create good public policy that will benefit each of them in, in this, as best we can. Um, to get more particular there in, in the legislature, I chair the Senate Subcommittee on Appropriations for General Government. And there we, we have the budgets for about 18 different state agencies that come under our, our uh, committee. The Department of Environmental Protection, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Financial Services, the Department of Revenue, the Department of Lottery, mm -hmm. and the list goes on and on and on. Um, but we have, we have uh, it's about a $5.4 billion budget that we have to put together every year just for my subcommittee. The total state budget is about $78 billion this year, so my portion of it is a relatively small percentage, but it's a very important percentage because without those state agencies, our government would cease to operate. And so we're, we're very uh, fortunate to have the good men and women there that work for those state agencies, and the overwhelming majority of them are good, hardworking, conscientious people. Uh, then I also am the vice chairman of the um, Government Oversight and Accountability Committee, and uh, Senator Ring is the chairman there. And that's a, a real good uh, relationship there that I thoroughly enjoy because it, it dispels the politics side that so many people have come to expect the warring factions between a Republican and a Democrat. And, and I have the same thing on my committee that I chair. Senator Oscar Brayden is my vice chairman. Oscar and Alan are good friends. Um, he comes from South Florida, I come from Central Florida. There's a lot of differences in our backgrounds and all that sort of stuff, but we, we shove all the differences aside and we work together to make good public policy. In the same way with Senator Ring, uh, he and I come from very different backgrounds, very different locations, but we work together to make good things happen. Then I also sit on the um, Environmental Preservation and Conservation <coughs> Committee that's chaired by Senator Dean. Um, that is the committee that actually puts together the policies of the environmental uh, community, the Fish and Game Commission and the Department of Environmental Protection and any other type of environmental issues. My subcommittee handles the financial part of it, and then Senator Dean's committee handles the policy side of it, and Senator Ring um, has the government oversight um, and accountability type of part of it as well. Then I also sit on the Ethics and Elections Committee. Uh, that committee screens all of the gubernatorial appointments that, that the Senate has to ratify. And um, Could you break that down just a little bit more for me, for those who don't understand that? Okay. You're saying ratify and... and right. Saying. What happens is is the various boards across the, uh, the state, whether it be yeah. a board of trustees for one of the universities or one of the state colleges, or okay. whether it be a, 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 a board of... Uh, Managers, uh, the water district, uh, water management districts, uh, their board of governors are gubernatorial appointments. The governor appoints the members of those bodies, and then the governor also appoints people uh, such as the secretary of the Department of Management Services, the secretary of the Lottery, secretary of the Environmental Protection. All of these are appointed by the governor, and and then the Senate um, examines each of those candidates and their background and their expertise, and then we make a recommendation. Our, our Ethics and Elections Committee makes a recommendation to the full Senate as whether to confirm their, uh, their appointment or not. And if, if we don't confirm their appointment, then they, they're not allowed to continue serving. Um, is what it boils down to. And then, of course, elections, we have various uh, elections laws that we have to, uh, to uh, um, act on as well. The Fiscal Policy Committee is, is a new committee that just was created a year ago. And, and that was created with the intent of taking some of the workload off the Appropriations Committee. The, the, we found at the end of the session all the bills coming together um, had to go through the Rules Committee or the Appropriations Committee and it just became so burdensome. It was, it was a, 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 an obstacle 
to get a bill through the Appropriations Committee, that the sheer volume of bills was too great. So Senator Gardner created the Fiscal Policy Committee, and, and bills are referred to that committee instead of the Appropriations Committee if their fiscal impact is below a certain threshold. And so that's sort of the, the minor league Appropriations Committee. Uh, that's what the Fiscal Policy Committee. And then the Joint Select Committee on Collective Bargaining, um, I'm the alternating chair there. One year the Senate had a chairman, and then the next year is the House chairman. And we do just that. We, the, the various uh, uh, labor unions that deal with the state um, agencies negotiate their contracts and things, and if they come to an impasse on various things, then they bring it before our committee to, to try to bring about a resolution. That's what it boils down to. Okay, so let me ask you this question. Your mission, it seems you have a lot on your plate. Oh, yeah. I realize this. And you get hit with a lot of questions and a lot of emails and a lot of everything else. Your mission as the senator of uh, uh, here, uh, what exactly is your main mission? Besides doing this, as far as helping people, what is your main mission as being a senator, your backbone? What makes you, pushes your drive? Because you've got a lot. And, yeah. and to say that you're in charge or you're running or you're a part of, uh, that's a lot to do in, in one day, and a lot of people call for different reasons. What has been your mission and your passion with this? Because you've been in uh, politics for how long? Uh, this is my 12th year. That's a long yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> in the yeah, in today's world, yeah. So yeah. what is your passion? What, what drives you to make you want to stay doing this? Well, the fact that I love America, mm -hmm. and I feel like this country has given me and my family opportunities that would never have come in any other country. Um, I, I love the state of Florida. I love living here. I love our environment. I love the people. And, and it, I really boil it all down to saying, you know, I really care enough that I'm willing to get involved and spend my time and take the verbal abuse and the ridicule and the criticism of those who disagree with me about certain things. Mm -hmm. But I love the, the future of our country enough that I'm willing to take the time to try to help shape that future so that those coming behind us will have the same opportunities or better opportunities than my generation had. So let me ask you this. Are you going to uh, uh, stay with this for another 10 years? Or well, no, that's... <laughs> well, what, are you, what, are you, what, are you, what is your plans now? Well, I cannot stay any more than four years as a state senator because so of the eight-year term limits. Uh, at this time, I don't have any plans to go higher. You know, okay. no. um, that, that's that's a long ten years in this business, as you said. It's Twelve years is a long years. time. Ten years. So I wasn't sure whether you wanted yeah. to become, uh, I guess, the next step. No, I will tell you the truth. Politics was never on on my bucket list. Anyhow, I had okay. no political aspirations whatsoever. This, the good Lord, put me in politics, mm. and, and it just shows He has a tremendous sense of humor. Mm. Um, but I was willing to follow his leadership. I was, I was a very successful dentist for 27 years, thoroughly enjoyed and still enjoy dentistry as a profession. It's just a wonderful, wonderful profession. I never dreaded going to work unless I knew I had personnel problems. But to, to be able to just sit down and do dentistry and help people that way is, is, is a thrill. I feel so blessed to have chosen a profession that after 40 years I still enjoy. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I'm nowhere near burnout on it. But anyhow, I sold my dental practice in 2003, and my wife and I thought we were going to semi-retirement. I was going to spend my summers up in western North Carolina mm -hmm. in the mountains where it's nice and cool. And she didn't get upset with you when you changed your mind? Oh, no, no not no, at all. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and so we, uh, we had started toward that goal and had a home built up there and everything, and then in 2004, I was persuaded by some people to run for the House of Representatives. Oh, wow. And I said, guys, there's no way I could ever be elected. I said, I'm very opinionated, I'm mm. quite blunt, I'm politically incorrect most of the time, and I'm not going to, mm. to lie to a group of people hoping they'll vote for me. Mm. And I said, I just don't, well, long story short, I, uh, I took 36% of the vote in a five-person race, and I was the last person to get in the race. And I only had 10 weeks from the day I decided to run mm -hmm. to the day the election was 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. I got 36% of the vote, and uh, I've been in the legislature ever since. It's, it's a, a very invigorating challenge. Um, the bulk of my time is, is spent helping other people 
cut through the government red tape. Mm -hmm. I have a very, very capable staff, uh, dedicated ladies who, who are hard workers. As a matter of fact, I had a couple of guys working for me also. So I'm, I'm gender neutral. Uh, <laughs> as the father of, of three mm -hmm. daughters and mm -hmm. the grandfather of seven grandchildren, it's, it's great. But um, very, very conscientious people that, that enjoy helping constituents. And, and that's really what it's the bulk of our, our tasks are all about. Okay. So uh, getting back on your subject, after you made up your mind to get into politics, mm -hmm. is that safe to say again? Mm -hmm. After you made up your mind to get in that and then still deal with the stress, what is the most, and I'm going to be honest with you, I want to know what is the most stressful thing. Let's say one day I decide to get into mm -hmm. it. What would be the most stressful thing or advice you can give to the young people who want to get into politics and make a difference or a change? I would say that the first thing you need to do is be a person of unquestionable integrity and honesty and, and have an interest in helping people. If you're getting into politics for your own glory, there are a lot of other ways that you can gain glory and recognition without having to put up with the aggravation and the criticism and the ridicule by people who don't know the whole story. Um, the thing that, that frustrates me most is people that are unwilling to take the time to become fully informed on the issues. Correct. And they will, they will believe something they read in the newspaper or something they hear on TV and they'll take it and run with it. And, and they're completely mistaken. But yet, the newspaper said it. Oh yes, it's got to be true. Well, I hate to tell you this, but that is a wrong, wrong assumption. And um, that's, that's the thing that disappoints me the most, is people who, who don't become fully informed on the issues. So, uh, when it comes to, not to get on some of your subjects, things you've been through, mm -hmm. but uh, how did you, and I'm going to have to ask you, how did you make the transition, we're talking about a dentist mm -hmm. becoming a politician. That's a heck of a transmit. I mean, just yeah. changing your way of yeah. thinking, getting informed, yeah. getting the knowledge, knowing all of this. How was the first couple of years? I mean, wow, you know. Um, on, on the various issues, it was somewhat like trying to take a sip of water out of a fire hose. Uh, as a matter of fact, I clearly remember sitting there in one of the committee meetings, and they were, they were throwing acronyms around like it was their everyday vocabulary, which today is my everyday vocabulary. I understand right. that. But I, I said to the committee chairwoman, I said, Madam Chairman, some of us are rookies here, and we don't understand all your acronyms. Is there any way we could have a dictionary of acronyms? <laughs> and, and there was a lot of chuckling around the table, but the very next time that committee met, sitting right there on our, de our desk, was the dictionary for acronyms. Okay. Uh, you know, it, yes, it was quite a, quite a transition going from dentistry into the political arena. And I, I tell people all the time when they, when they call me a politician, I'm not offended by that, mm -hmm. but I am not your typical politician. To me, the typical politician is a person who will tell you whatever he thinks you want to hear, and he'll tell that person over there, and then tell three or four different stories, and then who knows how they're going to vote. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's, that, to me, is the typical connotation of politician. Now, if, if one is a politician simply because they're involved in politics and elected to an office, then yes, I am a politician. But I say, no, I'm not a politician. I'm a country dentist who cared enough about the future of this country and this state that I was willing to get involved and take the abuse that comes from so many different angles and do what I know is, is good public policy. Now, the other day I was out, and as you know, I interviewed people. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the questions, and that's why I had this for you, quote, what's the difference between a statesman and a politician? And you feel in your, right. in your terms. In my mind, a statesman is, number one, a person of integrity, okay. a person who is true to their principles, a person who will discuss with you and may very well disagree with you, but they will respect you. Mm -hmm. And in their disagreement, they do it in a respectful way. That, to me, is a statesman. A person who is willing to embrace the principle of compromise without compromising their principles. That to me 
has been the key to being successful in the political arena, is being willing to compromise without compromising my principles. And that's where I draw the line. And, and we, had, we had an issue just this past session where I went to the Senate President and I said, Mr. President, there is no way at all that I'm going to vote in favor of your big issue. Mm -hmm. I recognize that. But I went to him one-on-one, -on -one, man to man, and, and I said, now, I'm going to vote no, but I said, I will be a quiet no. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to stand up and make a big scene and all this stuff. I'm going to be respectful, and I'm going to vote no. And, uh, and he appreciated that, mm -hmm. and he respected me for that. You know, how many times do husbands and wives mm -hmm. get into a, a disagreement and the end result that they both live with is not what either of them wanted first, but it's a satisfactory resolution. They have compromised without compromising their principles. And that's, that's what it's all about, is mm. finding a, a suitable agreement point mm. where we can go forward and, and everyone can benefit some and nobody gets greedy. That's the big key. Now, you being a senator. And we have councilmen and congressmen. You're very calm, okay? Oh, and I'm, I'm just going to on this issue. Yes. So I'm sure that there has been times, if someone is newly coming into this, mm -hmm. I don't know when your term is going to be over, mm -hmm. but if somebody wanted to come into this, we talked about stress, what type of person would they really need to be to sit and deal with a million different attitudes, a million different issues, a million is without letting the stress either kill them or put them in a the hospital yeah. or they get angry and as I've seen on TV they're fighting inside of yeah. the meetings. So for you to get where you're at today, I'm sure and, 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 and you've been a dentist, you've been in business, mm -hmm. but the transition that takes something that you know is right and yet is being flaunted as wrong and then sit and have to deal with it. What state of mind? See, you think about this whole magazine about what I do. The state of mind you have to be in to sit and talk to somebody who you know really is far out there. Mm -hmm. Their opinion mm -hmm. is all the way out there. But yet you've got to sit mm -hmm. and you've got to deal with it. What, what, what would you say to the young person who's going to get into politics? What do they need to prepare themselves for in that aspect that they don't lose everything they got by getting in the fight? Well, they need to understand that you first have to be true to your principles. Okay. And I, I have had several instances. One comes to mind immediately. A lady sat in my office there in Tallahassee for probably 10 minutes, and she had brought two other people with her. And, and I listened to her very respectfully, and I didn't interrupt at all. But when she finally quit talking, mm -hmm. I just looked at her and I said, ma'am, I can tell that you're very passionate about your issue, but I said, I'm going to be honest with you. There is no way on earth that I would ever support such action. And her first reaction to me was complete disbelief. And I don't know if it was disbelief that I was honest with her or disbelief that I disagreed with her, but it was, it was astonishment all over her face. And then she looked at me, and, and, and I, as I was saying that, I was getting up from behind my desk mm -hmm. and, and walking to the door to open the door to signal them it was time to leave. Mm -hmm. And as, as she left, she didn't just shake my hand. She gripped my hand, looked me straight in the eye, and said, Thank you for your honesty. We need more people like you in this process. And I said, Well, thank you, ma'am. I said, I'm just being Alan Hayes. That's all I am. Well, you know what, in closing, I'm going to read something, and I okay. want you to actually tell me what you think about it. Okay. Uh, Napoleon once said when asked to explain the lack of great statesmen in the world, to get power, you need to display absolute pettiness. To exercise power, you need to show true greatness. Greatness and pettiness, these two conflicting leadership traits cannot exist in one. How do you feel about what Napoleon has said? I would prefer to choose greatness mm -hmm. over power. Okay. Um, so many people think of leadership as power. And I, I don't think of leadership as power. I think of leadership as influence. 
And there's where being a statesman comes in so valuable. You know, if I am six feet, six inches tall, mm -hmm. and you're five feet, six inches tall, I can power you into wherever I want you to go. But when I get there, all I have is you under my thumb. You're uncomfortable, and if I'm comfortable, there's something warped about me. But if if I'm still that six six and you're five six, mm -hmm. and I can say, Tony, would you come help me do this or that? Or Tony, can I help you get this or that? That sort of thing. We can still be at the same point and we can both be comfortable. I have influenced you to either help me or allow me to help you. And we have attained greatness. That to me is being a leader. It doesn't have a thing in the world to do with power. Leadership is influence. And I feel like my job as a leader of the state of Florida is to provide the proper influence so that five years from now we'll be in a better position than we are today. In closing, uh, is there anything you would like to say to the people out there? Um, I would just say thank you for this opportunity mm -hmm. to, to get to know you and, and to speak to the people that, that watch us. But I would also say be proud, be very proud to be an American. This country has so many opportunities that will never ever be found in other countries. And it's something we should all take pride in and look at that red, white, and blue as a true blessing from God himself. And let's just pray that our entire country will turn back to our founding principles that were based on Judeo-Christian morals and ethics. That's how America became the leader of the world, was by adhering to those Judeo-Christian morals and ethics. You can look through our history, you can look through our founding documents and our laws. This country became great because God Almighty had his hand of blessing on this country. And look at the children of Israel. They were his chosen people. And he blessed them abundantly until they misbehaved. And he withdrew that hand of blessing. And he'll do the same thing to the United States if we misbehave. We've got to get back to our founding principles. Well, I thank you for your time. I've enjoyed it. I hope it. that we will do this again. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to it.